Perfect. We can now um, see and hear you, sir. Can you uh, see and hear us? I can indeed. Yeah. Uh, good morning to you. Can uh, I call Mr. Ben Fote, please? Well, just before you do, there's just one or two things I'd like to say, if I may, Mr. Beer. The first thing I'd like to do is to thank all those who were kind enough to send messages of support to me via the inquiry during my recent illness. Um, that was very kind, and I much appreciated it. The second thing I'd like to say is that um, this four-week session uh, will, I hope, continue uninterrupted by any ill health on my part, but I have been advised that I should conduct the hearings remotely so that, um, unfortunately, I won't be able to pay visits from time to time to the inquiry. I believe that the assessors are present this morning and they will continue to attend from time to time. I'm sorry that I won't be able to do that, but obviously I will review that uh, once we get into the autumn and hopefully I will be fully recovered. Just two minor points about the uh, timetable. Tomorrow, if we may, could we start at 10.15, Mr. Beer? That's simply to facilitate an early morning medical appointment of mine. And then on the 26th of July, could we finish by 2 p.m. again to um, <coughs> facilitate a medical appointment for me? And then one other announcement, uh, in a sense unrelated, but related to the fact that um, I held a hearing on the 27th, 23rd, or was it the 27th? Anyway, in late April, about compensation. And obviously, in the normal course of events, I would have produced um, either uh, an interim report or a progress update, as I promised I would at the end of the hearing. The current position is that I fully intend to produce an interim report before Parliament rises on the 20th of July. And, and I can't at the moment see any reason why I shouldn't be able to do that. So um, with those announcements, can I turn to this morning's hearing? Um, my understanding, Mr. Beer, is that you are going to question Mr. Fote. Uh, it is only you who will be questioning him. And then at the end of that session, um, I'll simply um, decide what should happen next. And thereafter, we'll commence phase four uh, with, I think it's um, Mr. Furling to give evidence. Is that correct? Um, yes, it is, sir. Um, save that Mr. Um, Furlintz um, uh, pronounces his surname. It is right. pronounced um, in that way we found out this morning. Right. Well, I'm very sorry for mispronouncing on the first attempt, but I shall remember in future how to pronounce his name. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, Mr. Folk, please. If you repeat after me, I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Uh, good morning, Mr. Fote. As you know, my name is Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you give us your full name, please? Benjamin Andrew Fote. Thank you for coming um, to the inquiry today to assist us in our work, and thank you for the witness statement that you have previously um, provided. You should have in front of you a hard copy of that witness statement um, in your name, dated the 21st of June, 2023. If you turn to the last page of it, page 19, um, is that your signature? that I have in my notes says GRO, but that 
that would be where my signature was placed. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, um, Herbert Smith Freehills, the post office uh, solicitors, kindly wrote to us pointing out a correction that you wish to make to paragraph 14A of the witness statement. If you turn that up, please. Uh, that's at the top of page five. Correct. And in the fourth line, a date is given as the 22nd of uh, August 2022. Would you like to amend that to the 12th of August 2022? That is correct. And then um, something that I'd spotted, um, if you look at page one and paragraph three, Uh, second line, a request pursuant to Rule 9 of the Inquiry Rules 2006 dated the 5th of June 2022. Should that be 2023? Correct. Um, Save for those two corrections, are the contents of that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. For the purpose of the transcript, and it's already been displayed, the URN is poll 00118164DS. Uh, that can come down from the screen. Thank you. I'm only going to ask you questions today about a limited range of disclosure issues arising from the disclosure to the inquiry on 30th of May this year of um, an appendix to a prosecution policy that contained um, racist and offensive identity codes. And in particular, I'm not going to ask you about the substance of the issues arising from that disclosure they will be addressed with other post office witnesses when the opportunity arises in phases four, five, and six of the inquiry. And we're going to ask you to return at a later stage of the inquiry to ask you questions about your role in other events that the inquiry is examining, principally phases five and six. Um, can I um, make two points clear before I ask the substance of my questions. It's right, isn't it, that you're giving evidence today following the service of a Rule 9 request, so a request for evidence addressed to the post office pursuant to Rule 9 of the Inquiry Rules 2006, and therefore you're giving evidence on behalf of the post office in a representative capacity, not a personal capacity. Is that right? That is correct. Does it follow that you are in part reliant on information given to you by others in order to write your witness statement and in order to answer my questions uh, today? Significantly so, yes. And um, the second point of clarity that I'd make, uh, like to make clear before we get to the substance of the questions, none of my questions are designed to obtain from you any information which the post office continues to assert a claim to legal professional privilege over. Do you understand? Understood. So please bear that in mind when I am um, asking the questions. So can I start with your background, please? You're a, a lawyer by profession, is that right? That is correct. And you have legal qualifications? Correct. You're the general counsel to Post Office Limited? That is correct. And you're a member of the executive team of Post Office Limited? Correct. Is that sometimes called the group executive? Uh, the general executive. General executive, thank you. Um, is that the most senior leadership team within the post office that's accountable to the board? Correct. And how long have you been general group general counsel? Uh, approximately four years since the 1st of May 2019. And in um, short order, what does your role as general counsel involve? Uh, ultimately, I'm responsible for um, instructing the uh, legal department and the law firms um, and, and therefore managing uh, legal services uh, to the company. I in addition to that, um, there are other areas of responsibility uh, as well, uh, such as uh, compliance, uh, and I'm the, the chairman of a subsidiary company um, with the post office. What role did you perform in the post office before coming, uh, becoming group general counsel? L uh, legal director. And uh, for how long were you legal director? Uh, I was appointed in August uh, 2016. And before that, were you, did you work outside the post office or within the post office? Um, 
prior to that, I commenced employment at the post office on um, in August 2015 uh, in the capacity of uh, uh, head of legal for financial services. So I was dedicated to the, the financial services team at post office. So August 2015 to date, uh, the role as a lawyer within the post office, uh, being promoted to legal director and then promoted to general counsel in May 2019? That's correct. As group general counsel, what role specifically do you perform insofar as the post office's engagement with the inquiry is concerned? Um, so um, ultimately, obviously, there is a board that makes um, decisions and certain decisions are delegated to the, the uh, general executive. And in this particular case, there is a, uh, a general executive subcommittee that makes the decisions. Um, part of my responsibility is making sure that the provision of legal advice and services is given to the company. You've previously made four interim disclosure statements to this inquiry and previously a witness statement. This is your second witness statement, is that right? That is correct. Do you consider that the post office um, acts under a duty to be candid with and to assist the inquiry? Absolutely. Uh, that, amongst other things, fulfills a commitment which a series of very senior post office executives have made publicly and to the inquiry? Correct. Uh, you've been general counsel since May 2019. That was just after a huge disclosure exercise had been completed in the group litigation. Is that right? Um, I recall that the uh, what was referred to as the common issues judgment had been handed down, I think approximately um, March 2019. Um, the Horizon issues trial was halfway through at that point. Um, there were basically a series of trials that were to occur in respect of the, the GLO. Um, which was the the name that we um, that was the program uh, that was uh, managing um, uh, that matter? Um, Did you pay any part in the disclosure exercise for the purpose of the group litigation? No. Did you play any part in the disclosure exercise that occurred in the run up to what I'm going to call the Hamilton appeals? Uh, the Court of Appeal. Uh, Correct. That's, at that stage, uh, I had become the general counsel. Um, but previously, uh, the GLO, uh, as we refer to it, um, was managed in a separate program. Um, and that didn't come through my line of responsibility as legal director. Um, obviously, when I became general counsel, uh, that, that changed. Uh, and uh, initially, uh, HSF. Uh, were uh, appointed um, um, in or about, I think, April uh, 2019. And what about the Hamilton appeals to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division? Did you participate in any way in the disclosure exercises for the purpose of those appeals? Um, Yes, I was general counsel at that time. Um, uh, Peters and Peters and HSF, uh, the two uh, law firms, were involved uh, in that process. And what about you? Did you superintend in any way those exercises? Uh, um, well, I, I was. I didn't actually do the disclosure exercise myself. Um, obviously, that is um, undertaken by. Uh, the relevant lawyers in the uh, external law firms. As part of the Hamilton uh, judgment, it's obviously a very complex criminal um, process, and so it was necessary to appoint uh, external criminal lawyers uh, to advise the board. Um, it's not part of the role of a general counsel to make decisions in respect of that, but certainly uh, to support uh, the board receiving advice in respect of what is required for disclosure. Do you understand that one of the very things that this inquiry is investigating is that how it came about that in very many criminal prosecutions brought by the post office, there was what was described by the Court of Appeal 
as per pervasive failures in disclosure for over a decade. Correct. And that we were investigating what the Court of Appeal described as polls, uh, the post office's approach to investigation and disclosure being driven by what the post office considered to be in its best interests rather than that which the law required. Uh, correct. That's a reference to the, the historical practices and I think specifically in the judgment referred to the investigation uh, practices that were conducted at that time. Well, and the disclosure practices. Indeed. And that we're investigating the underlying facts which the Court of Appeal described in relation to disclosure as being failures that were so egregious that a prosecution in any of the Horizon cases was an affront to the conscience of the court. That is correct. And so against that background where the inquiry is investigating the post office's past disclosure failings which led to wrongful convictions and to imprisonments, do you agree on behalf of the post office that its disclosure in this inquiry must be punctilious, it must be prompt, and it must be complete. Correct. Um, Post Office is absolutely um, committed to making sure that there is uh, full disclosure. Um, and I, if I could just say, um, you know, genuinely, everyone in the teams, in the, the different law firms, are working incredibly hard. Um, I. I recognise that there are a number of areas where we have fallen short, and I do apologise to the inquiry and especially to the core participants, um, but genuinely the team are working incredibly hard to make sure that we do um, the full disclosure that we, um, we must do um, and remediate any issues uh, that do come to light. How many people within um, the internal post office legal um, support division, if I can call it that, uh, are uh, working on inquiry disclosure? Um, so within the post office internal team, uh, it has varied over the years, depending on uh, as the inquiry has evolved. Uh, it will have varied from anywhere I think between uh, four uh, to what I understand is now eight uh, uh, lawyers. Um, of course, uh, there are many issues that the inquiry lawyers must attend to uh, in addition uh, to disclosure. You're um, assisted, I think, by um, Herbert Smith Freehills, HSF, as you've referred to them already. They're the post office's recognised legal representatives in the inquiry presently. That is correct. And um, can you give us a similar figure, please, of how many are working or have been working? I imagine that waxes and wanes as well it, in, on the inquiry. Indeed, my understanding is that 46 uh, uh, lawyers uh, are working uh, specifically on these disclosure and remediation issues. Uh, I'm happy to come back and, and give an exact figure, but, but that is my understanding based on what I've been told. And same question, please, in relation to Peters and Peters. Um, I think there's much smaller. Again, I'd want to come back, but my understanding is that there are at least five uh, can you um, uh, explain briefly, please, the role that Peters and Peters presently perform? Sure. Um, so as part of the uh, disclosure process, um, what Peters and Peters, uh, and indeed Post Office, sought to do was to make sure that we uh, could collate all relevant uh, materials so that when Rule 9 requests came through, uh, the organisation would be in a position to be able to respond to those. So uh, back in 2020, um, Peters and Peters uh, were looking at what was called the post-conviction disclosure exercise, 
and as part of that exercise, um, they were searching through repositories uh, of information, and that was part of a disclosure exercise that you've uh, referred to previously in relation to the Hamilton judgment. Um, subsequently to that, um, in January uh, 2022, uh, Peters and Peters uh, uh, also undertook in advance of the uh, Rule 11 and 14 requests, uh, again, looking through the, the data repositories of post office, uh, which I should say is complex and, and vast. Um, and they were trying to ascertain and get as many of the, the relevant documents, or rather responsive documents, um, so that when the uh, Rule 11 and Rule 14 requests came in, Post Office was able uh, to search them. Are you satisfied that everyone within each of the teams that you've just mentioned understands that this inquiry is itself investigating pervasive disclosure failures that lasted over a decade that sent people to prison? Yes, I, I do believe everyone that is working at HSF, Peters and Peters and Post Office, um, we recognise that this is an extremely serious issue. And that therefore the Post Office's disclosure obligations in this inquiry are heightened because we're investigating the issue of non-disclosure? Quite. You mentioned in your witness statement a unit within the post office called the Central Investigations Unit. What function or functions does the Central Investigations Unit perform so far as concerns this inquiry? Uh, so the Central Investigations Unit was a unit uh, that was uh, relatively recently established. Um, following the criticisms that were contained in the Hamilton judgment, which referred to um, investigations and uh, disclosure not being satisfactory, uh, the Central Investigations Unit was established to make sure that good investigation practices occur across the organisation. So it's what I call a second line of defence function in that when issues arise within the organisation, uh, that require an investigation, the Central Investigations Unit makes sure that those issues are investigated appropriately according to industry standards. A, a line of defence against whom? Oh, uh, sorry, I use the expression, um, the second line of defence. It's a compliance concept, three lines of defence. So in summary, the first line of defence is usually the business that does the activity. The second line of defence is a, a assurance function, so that can commonly include a legal department compliance function, an assurance function, and then the third line of defence is an audit function. And what function do they perform specifically in relation to the disclosure exercise being undertaken for the purposes of this inquiry? Um, in what respect? That's the, my question. Um, Do they perform any function in relation to the disclosure exercise that's being undertaken for the purposes of the, this inquiry? Not specifically unless there is a particular issue um, that, is, that is raised and, re and referred to them. And so um, in this context, um, uh, given uh, Appendix 6 uh, and um, the failure to disclose, um, they are involved uh, in, together with uh, an um, Jeremy Scott joint uh, KC. Um, I'm not sure he's a KC. Oh, apologies. I think he's only 2018 call, so I'm not sure that um, he will have quite achieved um, the status of King's Council yet. Uh, apologies. Um, uh, in any event, um, he's uh, of council that is um, providing oversight uh, to that investigation team together with uh, an organisation, Etica, um, to, to investigate. Uh, with that background, can we turn to the issues then, please? And can we start by looking at poll 00115668? Sorry, 5669. 
Right, that's going to be difficult. Uh, have you got um, in your bundle in front of you? Um, sir, I think it's in your tab um, B11 in volume one. A, um, a colour document called Security Operations Team Case Compliance. If you um, haven't, then please do borrow mine. I wonder if it could be walked around to you. Ah, yes. We've now got it on the screen. Sorry, is the document A3, um, poll 00038452? No, um, it's on the screen now. Okay. Is it right that um, for a period of time, the length of which has yet to be established and is presently being investigated by the um, Project May investigation team that you have just mentioned, that the post office maintained a, um, a and operated a suite of documents, there are eight of them, that gave guidance to members of its security team as to the construction and completion of files of investigation in the case of those suspected of criminal offences. So there's a suite of documents of which there are eight in number. Uh, correct. Um, it's not the um, central investigations team, but it was the security. Yeah, I said security team. Oh, my apologies, Sorry. security investigations team. And um, the document that we're currently looking at on the screen, is um, this the first in the series of eight documents? I understand that to be the case. Thank you. And um, I'm not going to delve into the substance of the issues, as I've said already, but in order to provide some um, understanding of the documents we're about to look at, can you um, assist us with what your understanding is of um, what this document is, so at the front of the suite of eight. Uh, so my understanding is that uh, this document uh, was used previously when post office conducted prosecutions. Um, it was used in two ways. One was a working uh, document and in the second um, respect, it was to act as a compliance check. So um, when I referred to a second line of defense before, um, I, uh, my understanding is that the document was to be used um, both in terms of um, undertaking the prosecution work, but also as a quality check. So it's how to um, structure case files <laughs> offender reports and other documents within the case file, and then there's a, um, a score on the right-hand um, uh, column, which if we just scroll down, we can see add up, adds up to 100. And if we scroll back up again, presumably these were marked, so look under file construction to take an uncontentious one, fourth row. The um, author of the document must use the correct font for all reports, namely Chevin Light 12, which is a font. And if they do that, they score half a percent. Correct. Yes? Correct. And is it your understanding that, the, um, that sitting behind this first document for a period of time which is yet to be established was a series of other documents that fed into or assisted 
the completion exercise contemplated by this document. I understand that is the case. Thank you. There are connected documents. Yes, yeah, so there are some documents that are connected to, that help you to do the things that this requires. That's my understanding. Thank you. Now, amongst the documents that sit behind or sat behind that first document, can we look at them, um, please? Poll 00115670. Oh. Thank you. You'll see um, this is entitled Post Office Limited Security Operations Team Compliance. Um, guide to the preparation and layout of investigation red label case files, file construction and appendices A, B and C. So it's a document of the post office and in particular its um, security and operations team. Yes? Uh, yes. And then we um, can see the purpose of the document by reading at the foot of the page the introduction. The aim of this document is to give guidance to security operations managers and team leaders on the current compliance standards for the preparation of red label case files and appendices A, B and C. Yes? Correct. And then another document that sat behind that first coloured um, uh, Excel document that we looked at can we look at um, poll Again, a post office document headed up security operations team with the subject of summarising um, tape recorded interviews. The purpose of the document is to advise security managers to changes in requirements for summarising tape recorded interviews. Yes? Correct. I recognise that as Appendix 7. And so we're looking at a series of documents that sat behind that first Excel document. Can we turn to poll? Um, two zeros one one five six seven two. I should just add when I say I recognise that as Appendix Seven, I recognise that now, obviously, yeah. not at the time. Poll two zeros one one five six seven two. Uh, again, an, another document in the suite that sits behind the Excel. And if we just scroll down to look at the document as a whole. What do you understand um, this document to be or the purpose of this document to be? Um, so starting on the, the first page, um, it's an investigation um, template. Um, that the security investigations team uh, would have used um, in the course of, of their work when they were in investigating and considering um, uh, prosecution. So if we go back to the first page, please. Thank you. We can see that um, it, it's in the style of a template. This one's blank. Um, and it requires uh, data to be entered in when a person is being considered for prosecution, essentially, yes? Correct. Um, you see in the top right, um, underneath the heading, um, it says identification code. Do you understand that to um, be a reference to a series of numerical codes that correlate to an assessment of a person's racial or ethnic identification? Correct. And so the um, author of the document, the person filling out um, this template, had to enter an ID code correct. for the suspect. That's correct. 
Uh, can we learn, look at another of the series of documents, please? Poll 20115674. This was another um, of the series of documents that sat behind or was related to the first document that we saw, yes, the, the Excel document. It's part of the suite. And it contains a description of seven identification codes, correct? Correct. And I should say I'm going to read out some of the identification codes on the document as they are printed. Um, uh, they are um, racist and offensive, but I'm going to read them out. Um, identification code one, uh, the document says that you are a white-skinned European type if you're British, French, German, Swedish, Polish, or Russian, yes? Correct. You are a dark-skinned European type if you're Greek, Cypriot, Turkish, Spanish, Italian, Sicil Sicilian, or Sardinian, yes? Correct. Uh, you are a Negroid type if you are West Indian, Nigerian, African, or Caribbean. You are Indian or a Pakistani type if you're Asian. You're Chinese or a Japanese type if you're um, Malayan, Japanese, Filipino, Burmese, Siamese, or from Mongolia or Mongolian, perhaps. You're Arabian, Egyptian, or an Arabian or Egyptian type if you are Algerian, Tunisian, Moroccan, uh, or North African, or you're not known. ID code seven. That is correct. So um, there was a collection of um, eight documents sitting behind the first one that we saw uh, the guide, the um, guidance summarizing the completion of tape recorded interviews, um, the um, ID code um, template, which required you to enter an ID code in, and then this identification code or ID codes document. Can I turn to the question that can come down? Thank you. Can I um, turn to the question? of um, disclosure of that material to this inquiry. Can we begin, please, by looking at a request made by the inquiry to the post office for disclosure of documents dated the 28th of February, um, 2012, um, INQ402007. Could you give me the date of that document again, please, Mr. Yes, 28th Pierre. of February 2012. Sorry, 2022. That, that, that's what confused me. Yeah. 2022. And if we just scroll up, just so we can see who it's from, thank you. It's from the inquiry. It's addressed to um, the partner then handling matters at um, Herbert Smith Freehills. And it's dated the 28th of February, 2022. And so it's a letter addressed to your recognized legal representatives in the inquiry. We can see from the heading uh, what the request is about. Request for information pursuant to rule nine of the inquiry rules, 2006. Request number 11, matters arising from board minutes, excluding project sparrow minutes. And you referred um, uh, earlier to Rule 911 and Rule 914. Um, were you using that as shorthand for the way in which the inquiry styles its requests? They are each sequentially numbered. This was the 11th in the series, and there's a summary of what it was about in that heading. That is correct. And so when you refer to Rule 911, that's what this is about. Correct. And so it's a request made pursuant to Rule 9 of the Inquiry Rules 2006. And for those um, not familiar, that's the provision, is this right, 
by which the inquiry formally requests the disclosure of documents from the post office and others. That's right. And if we scroll through um, the uh, document, please, you'll see that there's um, information about other things. And then if we stop there, request 15 within Rule 911 was a request for disclosure of the minutes of the Audit, Risk and Compliance Subcommittee of the um, 20, of 11th of February 2014 refer to a report which outlined the proposed changes to the prosecution's policy and a paper to explain the most appropriate way to communicate the prosecution policy. And then this, please provide copies of the same and copies of all iterations of the prosecution's policy since 1999 that are in polls, custody or control. And so it's that last um, sentence that's the operative one. Uh, is that right, Mr. Fote? Copies of all iterations of prosecution's policies since 1999 that are in polls, possession or control. Correct. And I'm not going to turn it up now. If we go to the last page of the letter, we can see that a response was due by the 31st of March 2022. So it gives a month to reply to the request. Correct. The post office responded to Rule 911, Part 15, on the 14th of May 2022, by disclosing some documents to the inquiry. And amongst those documents that were disclosed was um, one document that's relevant to the present issues. Can we look, please, at poll 3038452? Thank you. This is a version of the guidance that we just saw. Can you see that? Yes. Poll security um, operations team compliance guide to the preparation and layout of investigation, red label case files, offender reports, and discipline reports. So it's um, by no means exactly the same as the um, guide that I showed you earlier, but um, in very broad terms, fulfills the same purpose as the guide that we just saw, namely to give guidance on the construction of files and the contents of prosecution files. Correct. And so in response to request 15 in our Rule 911, we received um, this document. Correct. Correct? Now, I think you agree, Mr. Fote, that the documents which ought to have been disclosed in answer to the um, request were the suite of documents that we've just been discussing. Correct. And therefore, um, including the other iteration of this uh, guide, but also all of the other documents that I showed you, including the ID codes document containing the racist and offensive identity codes. Yes. Correct, the suite of documents should have been provided. And that should have been provided to us in the spring of 2022? I think uh, the, certainly the policy documents um, are absolutely needed to be um, provided. Um, I read them as being both the request 11 and request 14 as requiring the full suite of documents to be provided. Okay, we'll take that shortly in the interest of time. There was a follow-up request in August 2022, request um, uh, 14, so Rule 914, and you're saying that that would have captured all of the documents. I'm not going to quibble with you over which was the trigger, whether it was 911 or 914, but in the, by the middle of 2022, we should have had the suite of full documents. Uh, yes, correct. Sorry, the full suite of documents. Correct. Can I look at um, now why we didn't <coughs> get them? Sorry? Can I look now at why we didn't get them? Yes, sure. Can we look at your witness statement, please? Um, page five. 
paragraph 16. Thank you, it's page five. Paragraph 16 at the foot of the page. You deal with them compendiously. You say requests um, numbers 11 and 14 sought poll policy and procedure documents relating to poll's conduct of criminal investigations and prosecutions. To identify such documents, Peters and Peters and Herbert Smith Freehills ran search terms across a relativity database which I will refer to as the CCRC database. Just stopping there, uh, relativity database. Can you explain what a relativity database is, please? Um, it's an e-discovery electronic uh, disclosure platform. So um, within, the, uh, within the context of this inquiry, uh, it contains the data repositories of post office, uh, which contains, uh, I understand, 54 million documents. Okay, so it's a commercially um, available, purchasable e-disclosure platform. Correct. Uh, you continue, those searches were designed to identify responsive documents in a database that contains millions of documents. The CCR database is hosted by Relativity, on Relativity, by Poll's e-discovery provider, KPMG, together with other databases that hold Poll documents. The CCRC database contains materials collated for the purposes of the criminal appeals. Searches were and are run across this database for the purposes of disclosure in accordance with Poll's post-conviction disclosure obligations to conduct review, document reviews and to identify and produce documents uh, to the inquiry. And if we move down to paragraph 17, you say um, a document, which you've called Appendix 3, that's the guide. Yes. Yes? I'm going to call it the guide. The guide was responsive to the search terms run by Herbert Smith Freehills across the CCRC database for the purposes of request number 11. The other appendices were not produced for the following reasons. Copies, copies of appendices... Um, uh, one, two, four, and five. They're other of the suite of eight documents that sat behind the Excel, belonged to the same family of documents as the guide. Yes? Correct. I.e., those documents were all contained in a zip file that was attached to an email dated the 7th of March, 2013, that was sent by a poll security team manager. Correct. Although they belonged to the same family of documents, appendices one, two, four, and five were not produced at the same time as the guide because they were not responsive to the search terms, so they weren't reviewed for the purposes of responding to request 11. Yes? That's correct. So to summarize what you're saying is, for the purposes of responding to request 11, search terms were used, i.e. words, yes. were used. They only picked up the guide document, they didn't pick up any of the other documents. Correct. And that although the guide document was within a family of other documents, those other documents were not disclosed. Correct. And then if we go down to B, you say appendices six, um, seven and eight. Appendix six, that's the ID codes document that contains the racist and offensive language. Correct were not responsive to search terms and weren't within the family of the documents, and it wasn't apparent at the time that they belonged to the suite of documents. Correct. Can I ask you some questions from what you're, um, you're saying here? So an email has been sent on the 7th of March 2013 that contained appendices one to five as a zip file, yes? Mm -hmm. And the guide document was Appendix 3, and that caused a hit to a search term, yes? Correct. 
only Appendix 3, the guide, was disclosed to us, but not the other four documents in the family. That's correct. What guidance was given to your document reviewers about what they should do with documents that are within a family document, a family of documents, i.e. documents which are linked to one another, when only one of them is responsive to a search term? Uh, so there is guidance that's given to the reviewers. Um, there is both a first tier and a second tier uh, review. Um, reviewers are encouraged, if they do have any queries, to raise them. My understanding that to the approach to family documents is that they would look at the relevant context, the relevant request, uh, and determine whether or not the family documents should be looked at. In this particular case, they didn't look at uh, what is I call Appendix 1, 2, 4, and 5, uh, and I understand why, um, from what they have told me, the reason for that is because it wasn't responsive, <coughs> so they didn't look into the, the family of documents. So because... Just the, factually speaking. Yeah. So because there wasn't also a hit in the other four appendices, we're not going to look to see what those appendices contain to see whether they touch upon or are relevant to the document that does contain the hit. That is correct. Even though they're within a family together. Uh, yes, that is correct. And was that guidance... Um, was that the guidance that was given that you because th there are no hits in another it, another part of the family you don't look at the other part of the family um i would need to take that question away i'm i'm not aware i do know that there are cases where even though um there aren't those hits that family documents would be checked uh but it um it would depend on the relevant request. It would uh, request uh, depend on the suite of documents um, that was contained. So a zip, I imagine, a, a zip file. Um, but I'm not instructed uh, with that particular uh, detail. Have any changes been made to any guidance that did exist on how to treat families of documents since this um, episode has unfolded? Uh, since this has occurred, yes. Um, so uh, most recently, uh, HSF have gone through. Uh, obviously, to date, there has been uh, roughly disclosure of 117,000 documents. Uh, HSF have identified that uh, there are approximately 30,000 documents that would be family documents of the 117,000. They've then, obviously, that's just responsive. That's not necessarily relevant. They've then gone on to identify that there would be approximately 1,500 documents that are relevant, uh, of which I understand less than 700 would be relevant to phase four. The phase that we start in about an hour's time. Correct. Have you investigated the content of the instructions that were given to document reviewers that enabled them to discard other documents within a family on the basis that the other documents didn't themselves respond to a search term? That is an ongoing uh, question uh, for remediation. Would you agree that the approach of only disclosing documents within a family, if they're themselves responsive to a search term, is a rather mechanistic approach to a disclosure exercise? I do, ex I do agree. Um, it's obviously a very 
difficult exercise uh, to be managing a repository of 54 million documents. Of course, the reviewers don't know of the relevant documents. Um, so they are, uh, there's a number of processes that go on. So search terms is, is one way, um, uh, but there are uh, other avenues that are also uh, done to try and identify uh, the documents. But I accept your, uh, your premise. And it, it's rather mechanistic because it focuses on the use of ter search terms will turn over or potentially turn over the documents and only the documents that are responsive to our search terms and not apply a human mind to the documents that accompany or are related to that document. Understood. So if there was, for example, an email attaching two documents, two Word documents, asking for views from two people, and they set out opposing views on an issue, one of the attachments was worded in a way that was responsive to your search terms, and the other one wasn't. On this approach, the reviewer would only look in the document that was responsive to the search term and wouldn't look in the other document. Factually, that's what happened in this particular uh, situation. Um, I think the, the broader issue is around the deduplication. Um, I'm going to come to that in a moment. I'm just looking at what the reviewers did. If they're confronted with an email, mm -hmm. it's got two things attached to it. They get a hit from one document because a word has been used. Correct. They, they're not instructed. That's part of an email chain. There are two documents attached to the email. Have a look yourself in the other document and see whether it responds to the search uh, to the request. I th I think they are, and in certain cases they have done that. Um, I would like an opportunity to perhaps bring back that guidance. This is your um, opportunity, Mr. Fote. Um, we um, have asked you to set out in writing in your 19-page witness statement um, what occurred on this occasion and why it occurred. Yes. Is it your understanding on this occasion that the reviewer did not look in any of the other of the suite of documents in the zip file to see whether they are responsive to the request that was made? That is so. They didn't apply a human mind to it? I can't comment as to the, what was in their mind, but, uh, but it, what you have said is factually accurate. But is, is it an outlier? is what I'm um, driving at. Is it somebody made a mistake? Or is it because of the instructions they were given were faulty? If you've got an email that's got two attachments, 10 attachments, yeah. have a look, reviewer, to see whether the entire suite of documents should be disclosed. Was that instruction given? I don't think the instruction was given. And my rationale for saying that is that there were cases where they did check. Um, so, but I take your point and accept that the approach taken in this particular case was that had the family documents been checked, then it would have identified documents Appendix 1, 2, 4 and 5, but it wouldn't have identified Appendix 6, 7 and 8. When would Appendix um, 6, 7 and 8 have been identified? It, those documents would have only been identified in the, um, by a, the deduplication process. Uh, can you explain what the deduplication process is, please? Sure. Um, so uh, when providing documents to the inquiry, um, obviously in a massive repository in an organisation, um, there may be duplicates of, of documents. Um, so rather than actually provide literally the same document, there is a process uh, uh, called uh, deduplication. Now, in this particular case, where the error occurred, is that uh, instead of... Uh, Sorry, can, can I interrupt? The, the second error? Yes, correct. Um, uh, where the uh, error occurred, or second error, um, was that 
um, when you deduplicate, you should deduplicate if they're identical. In this case, there were other attachments that were deduplicated. So if I could perhaps explain that more clearly. Um, so when you have a, um, and we call talk about families of documents. So when you have what's called a primary or parent document, so a cover email, and it contains a series of attachments. So um, you might send photographs of plants, oh, sorry, photographs of plants, uh, which are the attachments. What happens in um, what's called top, top line um, deduplication process, if you have an attachment, an email, that has, sorry, you have an email, which is your parent document, and then you have, let's say, three attachments, which have three different plants, in so whatever sort of plant that you want. What should normally happen is that where you have literally the exact same replica of that, so there is another version that is identical, that has exactly the same cover email, with the same attachments of those three plants, that would then be deduplicated, and that's called the top, top line methodology. That didn't happen here. What happened in this particular case is that where there were versions, so instead of having an exact replica of, of the cover email with the three different attachments, where there were versions where there was the cover email, but let's say four plants that were attached to the email, the item line methodology that was used meant that it would consider them as the same when they were not. And they would therefore deduplicate, and therefore that is why the inquiry did not get to see, uh, well, and, in, and indeed the, re the reviewers didn't get to see Appendix 6, 7 and 8. You um, describe that in paragraph um, 18 of your witness statement on page 7. Just go over the page, thank you. At the top of the page, you say copies of Appendix 3, that's the guide. Yeah. Copies of Appendix 3 exist in duplicate and near duplicate form in the CCRDC database. Um, some of those duplicate versions of Appendix 3 oh. have family documents the duplicate versions of Appendix 3 were tagged as duplicate by Poll's e-discovery provider, KPMG, and so they were considered unnecessary to review. That's a shortened way of explaining what you've just said, yes? Yes, apologies. And so what you're saying here is that, um, as I've put to you, there's been a double error. There's the one we've spoken about already. But what you're describing, it, uh, the, um, the post office did, and its um, document um, providers did, is I find a document that's responsive to a search term. It's part of a family. I'm not going to look at the family. That document itself is also a part of other families. But because I've already decided to disclose that single document, the guide, I'm not going to look at other families in which that document appears. Uh, yes, that's the first first point on in, in, in respect of the approach to family documents. Yes. Yes. But um, you're not going to look at the um, appearance of that document elsewhere in the document universe because it is assessed to be a duplicate. Correct. So I missed the opportunity to see in what context the document appears in all of those other places in the document universe. Yes, had the deduplicate process been the accurate process, it would have led to the identification of all of the documents. And so you're missing the opportunity to see whether that document appears in another family and where in the family it appears and whether other documents in those other families also need to be disclosed. Yes, working it backwards, correct.
the um, guide to which Appendix 3, um, so the guide which is Appendix 3, was itself undated, wasn't it? Um. Th th there's, no, there's no date on it. I, don't, oh, I, I, I believe that yeah. to be so. Yeah, it's undated. W wouldn't it be important, therefore, to disclose the email of the 7th of March 2013 to show that that document and the other four documents which were part of the family were in circulation at that point, March 2013? Yes, but they weren't responsive. But I agree, they ought to have been, but factually they weren't responsive. Because all we get is a free-floating appendix that could be a year old, it could be 50 years old. We don't know the date of it. And so having the email that says this was sent between A and B on the 7th of March 2013 shows that it was at least in circulation then. Of, of course. Um, but it helps to try and date the document, doesn't it? Indeed, and, and for which you know, I, I can only uh, apologise. To be fair to the reviewer, of course, if the documents weren't responsive, they themselves wouldn't have known. But this document was responsive, wasn't it? The guide oh, sorry, was Appendix the guide. 3 was. Yes, the guide was. But the correct. email um, to which it was attached wasn't itself disclosed. Correct. All we got was an undated document. Correct. Can we look at a, a similar problem, please, and turn to paragraph 44 of your witness statement? Which is on page 15. You say, um, an examination of emails obtained from the historic security team's archive has been carried out just to um, date this exercise. This is part of the um, post-revelation of the problem clear-up exercise, is that right? What you're referring to happening in paragraph 44. Apologies, if I just have a moment yeah, sure. to read the context. go back to the heading to paragraph 36 it says investigative steps and preliminary findings mm -hmm. you tell us from paragraph 36 onwards things that have now been done in the light of the revelation of the problem the non-disclosure problem um, correct the the um, the point why I, I reflect is that um, whilst there have been examinations, that there have been a number of steps that have been taken, obviously before now, in order to secure documents and to speak to, to people. So that, that's just the point of, I was attempting to clarify. Yes. Um, but yes, um, obviously since uh, the 30th of May, um, there has been uh, an, an examination of, uh, of all of this to remediate the issues as quickly as possible. And so in paragraph 44, you're referring to what's been done now, now that the non-disclosure problem has been pointed out, yes? Um, yes, other than to say, of course, that um, the relevant documents were collated and put on to relativity, the, um, and it was done initially through the um, in 2020 in the post-conviction disclosure. Yeah, so the documents you're referring to in paragraphs 44 um, A to E were in fact on uh, relativity at the time that the searches in um, March and then August 2022 were carried out. Correct. And what I want to uh, understand is why they aren't, uh, weren't turned up in March and August 2022. So in paragraph 44, you set out a series of emails which you say are from the historic security team's archive. 
Um, there are five of them, but um, A and B are essentially the same chain. So there are four email chains. I just want to go through them, please. Can we start, please, with a poll 00118906? Poll 001-8096. Thank you. And if we can scroll down, please. I'm sorry, just at the bottom of the first page. Thank you. You can see um, it's an email dated the 23rd of May 2011 from um, Dave Posnert, um, who was an accredited financial investigator in the security operations team, um, to a, um, a wide group of people. Yes? Correct. Um, and he says, under the subject, uh, case compliance, most of you are aware that case files submitted for legal advice will be become subject to compliance checks. This process is due to commence in June and is designed to raise standards of files submitted, including their contents, reports, tape summaries, appendix enclosures, recovery, stakeholders, etc., and ensure there's a consistent approach across the team. It's also probably an opportune time, given we've already um, re we have recently recruited new people to the team. I've um, associated relevant documents that feed into the compliance process. Please familiarise yourself with these documents. Um, and then there will be some meetings and the dates are set out. And if we just scroll up, we can see a forwarded um, email um, of August 2011 attaching the compliance zip that Mr. Posnett referred to. Yes? Correct. So you've got e an email of May 2011 from Dave Posnett of the security team to a wide range of people in the security team attaching a zip file about case compliance. Now, that zip file um, contained a series of documents. Can we look, please, at poll 00118101? We can see it's the guide, yes? Yes. And so the guide would have been responsive to the search terms in the same way as Appendix 3 was and produced a hit, yes? Um, the, the guide, which is Appendix 3, yes. was responsive. Yes. And so if a search had been undertaken using those search terms, this guide being an attachment to this email as part of a zip file would also be responsive. I don't think the email would have been responsive, but the guide, Appendix 3, yes. And what is displayed to the reviewer when they get a hit? Um, they have a list, uh, there's a, a whole list of documents that they have, um, so they would have to click into it to actually see the relevant document. And what is displayed to the reviewer to show them that it is um, part of a family of documents? There is an, my understanding is that there is an icon um, that they would have to click into to link it into um, the family document. Um, and, and so just but, go on. but I, I don't think 
and I'm, ha I'm happy to check this, but I don't think that email would have been responsive because looking at the email, it doesn't contain any of the search terms. No, but the, yeah. if the guide contained a responsive search term, the reviewer can click the icon to see which um, email this was an attachment to. Correct. And so what are they told, the reviewers? Are they told to do that, to check the email? Because if, if they'd done that on this occasion, we would have seen that this um, guide, also undated, was in circulation in May 2011, wouldn't we? And we would seen who was circulating it. Yes, the, the reviewer does a, a linear review. What does um, that mean? Well, in the sense it's, it's sequentially, so they they don't necessarily know all these documents exist. It's just the documents that come up that are responsive, and then they will go through them. Um, and my understanding is that um, where it is responsive, they would check the family uh, documents. And so what, what's happened here then? Because we've got a, an email from Mr. Posnert to a whole bunch of people in the security team mm -hmm. saying, you need to comply with this compliance document. That's important, isn't it? Because the email shows who was distributing it. The email shows to whom it was distributed. The content of the email shows an instruction. You must comply with this, and you're going to be audited for your compliance. They're all relevant things that we get from the email that we don't get from the guide. Of course, and I, I recognise that. Uh, I think factually what happened here is that because the um, cover email, if you like, wasn't responsive, it was sitting, um, I imagine it would have been sitting in the family documents, but it was not checked. That is plainly wrong. And so um, I, I acknowledge that point, but just factually, that's why I don't think that email was picked up um, at that point. Can we look, please, at poll... 0118104. This was also an attachment to Mr. Posnitz's email, the racist and offensive ID codes document. And so this was part of the family too. Agreed? Uh, agreed. And so if we got the email, we would know that it was Mr. Posner's on the 23rd of May 2011 distributing to a wide variety of people within the security and operations team saying you've got to comply with these racist and offensive ID codes and you'll be marked down if you don't. That's relevant information for us, isn't it? Uh, cor correct. And had the, had the approach to search terms, family documents and deduplication been right, uh, it would have been identified. Because one of the things that Paul has said in response to this part of the scandal within a scandal within a scandal is these are outdated documents, they're from the past. But as we pick away at this, we might find that by looking at the emails, that in fact they were in circulation until quite recently, might we, if we get the emails? Well, th there is my understanding is that they are historic um, in nature. Um, my belief about that must, and that they must necessarily be so because the post office stopped prosecuting and has not prosecuted. Um, and that policy came in in, in 2019. Um, I, I recognise um, the, the racist and unacceptable uh, language that's contained um, within that document um, and for which I can only um, apologise to see that. That is certainly not consistent with my values and nor the um, current post office. I accept that is a document that clearly was in existence at that um, time. It wasn't just in we existence, are... was it? It was being circulated and saying you must comply with its terms, and if you don't, you'll be picked up for non-compliance. In, in 2011, yeah. um, that appears to be the case. Okay, let's go on, please. Uh, can we look, please, at poll 
two zeros one one H double one zero. Can we start by looking at the second page, please? And just scroll down, please. It's from Mr. Posnett again, um, dated the 27th of April, 2012. You see that? Uh, 27th of April, correct. Uh, an email to a wide variety of people in um, security operations team, again. Um, subject is case compliance. He says all the compliance checks on submitted offender interview case files will continue in 2012-2013. Associated are all the supporting documents needed which have been amended um, where appropriate. Can you see that? Correct. And then if we go to page one, we can see somebody um, called Andrew Wise who was in Security Operations North, forwarding that email in October, the end of October 2012, forwarding um, the last attachment, the compliance zip file, to a group of people who I think were in Security Operations in the north of England. Hi all, I'm assuming that most of you, if not all, have seen the case compliance info before. Now that everyone is up and running and progressing cases, I thought it would be a good time to refresh on the compliance checks. So he's forwarding a zip file too. So it's forwarded again the year after that we've just looked at it by Mr. Posnett, and then in October 2012 by somebody else within security and operations. Can we just look at um, a couple of the attachments within this zip file and poll 0011-8124. It's the guide again, yes? So the email that's being sent around as a compliance requirement in April and October 2012 amongst the zip file includes the guide. And then poll 0011-8128. Another um, part of this zip file being sent around within poll in April and October 2012 is the racist and offensive ID codes document. And so would you agree that um, the email that I showed you of April and October 2012 was um, relevant information for the inquiry to receive? Agree. Because it shows that, again, the um, compliance guide and this document were being circulated with instructions to security teams that they will be audited against their compliance with their terms. Yes, yeah, certainly I, I understand under request 14, uh, which included guidance, um, that it, it ought to have been um, disclosed. And so looking at the April 2011 and now the um, April and October 2012 emails, all three of which had the guide and the racist and offensive ID code document attached. Can you explain whether it's the pool of documents over which the search was run that caused them not to be included or the deduplication exercise that you referred to that caused them not to be included in material sent to the inquiry? My understanding is it's the deduplication exercise, and I say that because um, in addition to the various um, 
setting up of the data repositories and the PCDE work review and the review that was done by HSF and Peters and Peters with their search terms, they had also interviewed Andrew Wise um, and had also taken um, all of the, the relevant materials from his uh, laptop. And so my understanding is that they would have been, they are on relativity, um, but because of the search terms, families, and specifically in this, the deduplication, um, they, it wouldn't have been picked up to the reviewer. Um, I just want to press you on that. Sure. In paragraph 16 of your witness statement, no need to turn it up, you say that the pool within relativity of material that was looked at for the purposes of these two requests was the CCRC. Mm -hmm. This material appears not to be within that pool. Um, so was that the problem, looking at too small a universe, or was it the deduplication exercise that um, meant that this material was excluded and therefore, um, even though there may have been a hit against it, uh, was not disclosed to us? My understanding is that it would be the deduplication exercise. And on what basis do you um, reach that understanding? Sure. Because the CC, uh, I agree, it wouldn't necessarily be picked up in the CCRC or the PCDE exercise, but that isn't the only database that sits within relativity. So relativity, as I said, has over 54 million documents. The CCRC database has over 5 million documents. There are over 160 different data repositories within uh, relativity, as well as all of the mailboxes. And so whilst I accept that these emails may not have been picked up in the CC CCRC database, my understanding, but I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on the point, is that it wouldn't have been identified because of the deduplication error. But I'm happy to take that away and, and, and report back to the inquiry. If we just look then at paragraph 16 of your witness statement, which is on page five, you say, in the second line to identify such documents. Peters and Peters and HSF ran search terms across a relativity database, which will I, I will refer to as the CCRC database. Um, dot, dot, dot. The CCRC database is hosted on relativity by Poles e-discovery provider, KPMG. The CCRC database contains materials collated for the purposes of the criminal appeals. Searches were and are run across this database, etc. It only refers to the CCRC database there, rather than other parts of the document universe within relativity. So I'm trying to establish whether that's the problem or the deduplication exercise which you have attributed the blame to. Yeah, I, I'm. As I said, I'm happy to come back um, to it, um, um, having taken instructions. Um, but my understanding with these requests is that um, the documents that weren't uh, disclosed um, ultimately, in all cases, had the deduplication been correct, then those appendix would have been disclosed. But I'm, I'm happy to come back and, and report back to the inquiry with specifics. Can we um, look at a third um, um, email, please? Poll 00118129. much um, narrower um, distribution between Andrew Wise and Helen Dickinson, Mr. Wise being a security manager in Chesterfield. Um, here is all the Dave Posnett stuff, sorry, the Dave Posnett sent through to me, the stuff Dave Posnett sent through to me. Can you see that? Yes, thank you. And attached to um, that email, so we're here now in July 2016, 
I'm not going to turn them up in the interest of time. Take it from me that the attachments to that included the guide mm -hmm. and the racially offensive ID codes um, uh, document. And so this email, if this had been disclosed to us, would have shown that in 2016, the guide and the racially offensive ID codes document were still in circulation amongst these, at least these two people. Uh, correct. And so can you help again as to why the uh, deduplication exercise had the effect of excluding the emails from disclosure to us? Um, because where you have um, the relativity system gives a preference to, to various versions of the documents and the preference that it would take normally is at the time. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is that um, on this particular case with the email, because the email itself wasn't responsive, it wouldn't have been picked up. So the search terms... The search term would have hit the guide. Absolutely, yes. And the reviewer could see an icon that yes. linked that to this email. Yes, that's it. and, and it's the same family issues uh, document that we, we've discussed. And so I'm going to press you again. Yes. Why is it that um, a reviewer would not go back and look at the family of which the document for which they had a hit was a part? Because in this particular case, they weren't responsive. That's not really an answer, though, is it? Because if they're responsive, they are going to um, d consider them for disclosure anyway. We're looking at a different issue, namely you have a document which is part of a family. Mm -hmm. Why do you not look at the rest of the family? Because it provides context, colour, assistance to this inquiry, doesn't it? Sure, and, and, and I accept that. Just factually speaking, my understanding is that although the guide, so Appendix 3, was identified, this particular email wasn't. Um, now, there are, a number of way, there are a number of reasons why that didn't. So given that on the face of this document, it doesn't appear to con, um, contain any of the search terms, it would seem to me that it therefore wasn't responsive. Because of the uh, approach that was taken with family documents, um, meant that such documents therefore wouldn't have been disclosed and if there was multiple copies of this it may not have been disclosed for that on that basis so I, I accept your your premise that it should have been uh, disclosed uh, but factually um, that's the explanation that I have for why it it has not been disclosed from those that were um, uh, managing and overseeing this process isn't it blindingly obvious, though, that where you turn up a document that's undated, you would see which documents were associated with it in order to try and date it and see who was passing it around within the organisation? But they may not have seen this, this cover email. Um, I, I, I take your point. Because, because they didn't look. Quite. And so what's been done to improve that situation? I, I appreciate that we're now going to get 1,500 documents for the hearing that starts in 26 minutes. Correct. So, um, and look, I, I appreciate there have been um, a number of areas which haven't been uh, done to the standard that we would expect, but we are quickly remediating them. Um, in respect of the search term issues, uh, new modified search terms uh, have been uh, designed and are being run. In respect of the family documents, um, uh, as I explained before, uh, we have already remediated that process. We understand that there are 1,500 documents of which um, un less than 700 will be relevant to phase four. I take your point uh, that phase four 
starts um, amid today. We've um, already had phases two and three. Un understood. Um, and so the approach that we would uh, take is to ensure that we prioritise the documents uh, that are relevant to phase four so that we can make sure that they are given to the inquiry uh, prior to the witness uh, giving evidence. And of course, we will work with the inquiry uh, to make sure that they are pri prioritised in that order. I mean, that's very kind, but it's, it leads to the situation where last night Mr Blake received from Paul three documents at uh, half past ten in the evening, I think, um, relevant to Mr Furlins, who was giving evidence in a minute. That, that's what this situation has caused. I, um, I appreciate that, and on behalf of Post Office and myself, um, absolutely apologise. Um, we are on it, though. We are remediating it. We're wanting to make sure uh, that we are transparent. I think one of the things that we have done throughout this process is that when these issues have been identified, uh, I've always ensured that we be completely transparent with the inquiry, that we disclose the issues, we disclose our approaches to ensure that there is that transparency and that we quickly remediate the situation uh, as quickly as possible. I think it's fair to say these issues need to be seen within the greater context of this extremely complex and large-scale disclosure exercise. Uh, lastly, please, can we look at um, poll 0011 And if we go to the second page, please. We can see that this is um, an email exchange of May, 21st of May 2019. If we just scroll down so we can see who Dimitri Rem was, a paralegal, an associate paralegal with Womble Bond Dickinson. Uh, if we scroll up, please. Uh, Dimitri Wren says, I'm assisting Mandy with disclosure queries, and in this case, SharePoint document extraction. Our data analyst has advised that the following SharePoint documents are password protected, and um, that they require a password to access them. And then over to the first page, please. And scroll down, please. Mr. Wise, a security manager, some of the documents we provided to Don uh, Bond Dickinson are password protected. I've tried the usual two security passwords we use. However, these do not work as the documents are from before they can into use. Would you have the passwords for these documents? They're the ones you collated onto SharePoint. So this is May 2019. It looks like for a disclosure exercise, the documents are being accessed um, and scroll up, please. You'll see that um, there is a, um, a zip file as an attachment, yes? And I'm not going to go through them again. Um, the guide is one of the do documents within the zip file, as is the um, racially offensive ID codes. So it looks like they were being considered, is this right, for disclosure? Would this be in the group? Litigation order, May 19. My understanding uh, from Womble Bond Dickinson as part of the ongoing investigation that we're undertaking is that uh, this email was associated with the, um, the further issues trial. So the further issues trial was a third trial that had been set down, which did not ultimately uh, eventuate. And so is the answer the same that um, the guide and the other suite of documents, including the racially offensive ID codes document, wasn't disclosed to us, even though the guide would have produced a hit uh, being an attachment to this email because of the deduplication exercise. Correct. Okay, that can come down. Um, it's right, isn't it, that um, um, Eleanor Shake made a uh, request on the 10th of April 2023 for documents which detailed the quality and compliance assurance processes for investigations which were implemented by post office security team in 20, 2008 to 2011. 
under the Freedom of Information request. That is correct. And the post office answered that um, FOIA request on the 19th of uh, May 2023, so about a month later, by disclosing all documents within the suite of eight. Correct. The ID codes document that we have seen does not detail the quality and compliance assurance processes itself, does it? Uh, no. It just contains some ID codes. Correct. So why was it disclosed to Miss Sheikh as part of a family of documents that detailed a quality and compliance assurance process, but not to the inquiry? Um, why was it picked up? This is a family of documents, which is all about compliance and assurance. We need to disclose all of them, even though this individual one is not on its face. The answer is because the FOIA team uh, wrote to the security team member, Andrew Wise, so you may recall his name from a number of the documents that you've just shown me. Um, Andrew Wise immediately, in, in being um, informed uh, as to the scope of the relevant FOIA, uh, namely the quality assurance and the, the audit, uh, knew exactly and could pinpoint immediately that those were the documents that would be responsive uh, to that particular request. So even though we'd asked for prosecution policies and prosecution guides, that same exercise wasn't gone through? Um, quite, but there is a different process um, that necessarily went through in terms of the inquiry. So in terms of the FOIA request, it was able to be sent to someone who immediately already knew of the existence of the document and could identify it and produce it. Obviously, in Could, Can we have some of that treatment too, please? Of, of course, and, and you do, but in order to provide a large-scale disclosure exercise where there is the 54 million documents, in this particular case, obviously the reviewers, unlike Andrew Wise, didn't, they don't know of the, the document's existence until they do the search terms, until they, they do that review. Um, so I, I take your, your point. I'm merely just trying to explain why the FOIA situation, why the documents were disclosed under FOIA and why that was an easier um, uh, process than the process that we um, undertake in terms of disclosure to the in inquiry. I absolutely accept they should have been disclosed um, uh, to the inquiry. And um, I've shown you... Um four occasions that emails um, circulated the uh, guide and the racially offensive ID codes document amongst quite a wide uh, group of people. Can we look at paragraph 40 of your witness statement, please? Which is at the foot of page 13. You say in your statement, email searches have so far identified 23 occasions on which Appendix 6, that's the racially offensive ID codes document, was sent as an attachment within the security team between 2012 and May 2019. So in addition to the four that I've pointed out, there are another 19 circulations, is that right? Uh, correct. And that goes right up to May 2019? Correct. Has the number increased since you made this witness statement from 23? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, there are a number um, of steps that we're, we're taking to, to verify uh, that number, but I, I don't have any uh, updated figure on that. 
what um, assurance or guarantee can you give to the inquiry, to the other core participants, and to the public, that what has occurred in this instance, a serious failure in Paul's disclosure, will not happen again? Well, firstly, um, I recognise that um, clearly, as we've discussed today, that there are a number of areas where we have fallen short, and I genuinely am apologise for that. I think we have taken immediate steps to remediate the issue. We are on it. We have already modified the search terms. We have already gone through the family documents approach. We are working through the duplication, uh, deduplication approach, um, which we, we know is not um, across all rule nines, for instance, um, but we are genuinely working through the issues to remediate them as quickly as possible, to be completely transparent with the inquiry, with where we are. Uh, and as I mentioned before, um, we do want to support the inquiry to be able to continue its work uh, and, and therefore prioritise um, the remediation in terms of the witnesses in, in phase four. What's the time scale for you completing that work realistically, Mr. Ford? Um, sir, I, I don't have any precise instructions on that point, um, but save to say that um, certainly uh, the search terms and the family documents uh, uh, will be shortly done, um, I understand, in a matter of um, uh, a fortnight or so. Um, the deduplication issue, I am I'm just not instructed at this time uh, to give a time frame. Because I am concerned that we are rapidly approaching a period when, quite justifiably, many people will be taking their holidays and the like. And therefore, there is the possibility of the remediation steps which you wish to take being prolonged. And um, so far as can be avoided, I want to avoid that. So I would like you, um, not now in the witness box, but shortly after you've ceased giving your evidence, uh, to, to, to discuss that as fully as may be, and to write to me giving me a pretty precise timetable of what we're looking at. I absolutely uh, will do that, sir, and, and in particular, if it would help the inquiry uh, to provide um, a, a direct report also from the people who are directly undertaking the remediation to give that clarity, not just in, in terms of the scope of the remediation steps, but also the, the dates in which we expect that to be completed. All right. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying uh, that my request to you, uh, just delivered, is the only request I'll make. I want to reflect upon uh, the evidence you've given and discuss it with my team. So I may yet issue um, directions in writing, um, uh, putting it um, neutrally to assist you to comply, uh, putting it more aggressively to make you comply w with a pretty tight timetable. Thank you, sir. Sir, thank you very much. Are uh, there the only question questions I ask, Mr. Foote? Thank you, uh, Mr. Beer. So, apologies uh, to the um, uh, uh, shorthand writer. We've gone straight through um, de deliberately. Uh, might yeah. you take a 15 minute break now until five past 12? Of course. Um, and. Uh, if it helps, um, I'm prepared to sit a little later this evening so that we don't rush the start now so that the shorthand uh, writer can have more of a break. Um, I'll leave that in Mr. Blake's hands to discuss, whether, discuss with everyone involved whether we need to, say, start at 12.15 and sit a little later or whether 5 past 12 is all right. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Can I now call Mr. Felins? Yes, of course. He's going to like to say after me. 
I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Can you give your full name, please? Yeah, it's Martin Charles George Flintz. Um, thank you, Mr. Flintz. Um, you should have in front of you a witness statement. Do you um, have that, or at least a bundle containing a witness statement behind tab A? Okay, I'll find that one. Yep, yeah, I have it in front of me. Thank you very much. Um, could I ask you, that, that statement is dated the 11th of May 2023. Yep. Could I ask you to turn to the final page? That is page 28, okay. just before we get to the index. Uh, and is that your signature there? It's my signature, yeah. Yes. Thank you. And is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is. Thank you very much. For the purpose of the transcript, that is URN WITN 0861010. Thank you very much. And uh, that can come down. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Flint. I'm going to start with your background. You were employed by what I'll refer to as the post office or poll uh, from 1979 to 2011 albeit it was known through uh, a number of different names throughout that period, is that right? Correct. You started as a counter clerk after the completion of your A-levels? Correct. Um, amongst your early roles, you were a Crown Office branch manager? Yeah, in the mid-1980s, I believe. And from 1989 onwards, you worked in various audit-related roles? That's right. In 1989, you were audit manager in Nottingham? Uh, that's right, order Matthew Martin. And in 1993, the post office was restructured into seven regions, and you became audit manager for the Midlands region, uh, and then the regional audit manager in 1995. Correct. Um, in 1998 or 1999, there was a review uh, that you've detailed in your witness statement. It was a review of the structure. Can you briefly tell us the purpose of that review uh, and its outcome? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure the timeline. It could have been 1998 when it started and 1999 when it finished. Um, essentially, at the time, so around about 1998, there were two auditing departments within post office. So you had a post office internal audit team, which comprised around about 30 members of staff based in Chesterfield or London, large in managerial grades, largely with internal audit qualifications, and that team um, basically audited head office functions. Separate to that team were regional auditors. They were largely people who had counter office background experience, didn't have auditing qualifications, and were separate from the internal audit team. So you have these two teams together. So around about 1998, the National Audit Team, which was the Post Office's internal audit team, decided to review the structure, the processes, the policies that the regional audit teams had in place. I was working, as you said, in the Midlands region, and I was seconded to National Audit to take part in this review. So that review looked at every aspect of the regional audit teams. There were seven regions. And the outcome for that review which took a few months, was to develop this new team called the Network Audit Team. And the idea was that that team would slot under the National Audit Team, so forming one auditing body with the internal auditors effectively managing the old regional audit teams. So that sort of summarises that project. Thank you very much. Was that in any way linked to the rollout of Horizon, which we know was in the 99 period? No. I don't believe it was. It wasn't, to my knowledge, any link at all. Uh, and in 1999 or thereabouts, you became head of network audit. So you were the head of that new team That's of right. network auditors. Um, and I think there came a point in time where the what you've described as the national audit team 
separated out and went to the Royal Mail, yes. and the network team stayed with the post office. Yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the idea was for this new network audit team to slot under the national audit team. Um, I'm not sure the time frame, but a short period after that team was devised, the internal audit team, and there was one in post office counters, Royal Mail, and Parcel Force, were moved into Royal Mail Group. And the decision was taken that even though that team would move to Royal Mail Group, the network audit team would still stay within Post Office Limited. And you became part of what we know as the security and investigations team initially, is that right? Yes, not immediately. So initially, because this team was sort of left without uh, a home, it was given a temporary line within the finance directorate and then it went to the operations directorate and then shortly after it was moved to a security and investigation team which itself was undergoing a review of its own structure. Um, uh, slightly confusingly following in that one of these reviews right. your team became called I think the national audit and inspections manager or you became the national audit and inspections Yeah to be honest when I've gone through um, my own memories I've struggled to work out at what point um, these role names change. But yes, National Audit and Inspections Manager. The inspections bit was once we came under the security team, um, we also looked at physical inspections while we were at branches. So my team would go to branches and include now a physical inspection of security, physical security. So that's why the team was then expanded to be called Audit and Inspections. And during that period, the core work that you were managing was branch auditing. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think you first reported to Tony Marsh, who we'll hear from tomorrow, and at some point it moved to Rod Ismay, who we've already heard from. Yep. How big was your team? Um, when it started, so when it was created in 1999, I believe it was 103 or 104 of which probably about 10 or 11 people were in a core admin team in Chesterfield. So the remaining 90 people would be dotted around the UK in various little places to be able to go locally to branches to audit them. So you described your, your, the early days of your work, you were in the regions, it was separated by regions. Was it um, now focused, concentrated on, on a national Team. Yes. So before this new team, there were seven regional audit teams doing things differently, with you know subtly different practices and different interpretations. So one of the aims of this new team was to bring some consistency to the operation. So it was a centralised managed team, albeit with resource placed around the UK. Perhaps taking this out of turn, and we will come to it. But did that in any way affect the way that um, that auditors related to the sub postmasters, for example? Did it break up any of those personal relationships that may have existed when it was operating at a regional level? Only in in the context of because we had less resource. This team of 103 um, for the network audit team probably would have been about 150, 160 in the seven individual teams. So there's less resource out in the field and therefore less local resource. So perhaps the local auditors wouldn't be from somewhere you were as familiar with if you were at a branch. And that change in resource happened when? The late 1990s? Yeah. And I'll just add to that, you know, from the creation of that team of 103, 104, the numbers were always coming down, so there were less and less staff in that team over the next six, eight years. And I think you've said in your witness statement there were issues, or, or there weren't new staff coming in because your team was actually getting smaller. Yeah, I mean, the broad policy at post office at the time was that there was no compulsory redundancy. So um, if any reductions in staff occurred, then those displaced staff would be found a new home. So, um, and I forget the term used for those people, but essentially, if a vacancy came up on my team, we would be expected to fill that vacancy with 
a displaced surplus person from somewhere else. Uh, but I don't recall many vacancies happening because of this constant reduction in, in staff. Um, and you've also mentioned in your witness statement about um, looking back a lack of people with IT expertise, for example. Was it difficult to bring those kinds of people in because of those difficulties? Because of those restrictions. And I think, to be fair, um, we're going back to 1999, stroke 2000. For most of my team, arguably all of my team, they probably hadn't even touched a computer since about 1995, or well, before 1995. So most people didn't have much IT background anyway, sent an email, used the Word document. So it's very much about learning on, on the go. And because new members weren't joining that team, you weren't getting people with more recent expertise. Exactly. Um, you continued in that role until 2006 or 2008. You're not entirely sure uh, the precise date. But yeah, can I just clarify that? Uh, I think reading through some of the other documentation that I've seen now in more detail, I think it might be that I changed role in 2006, but that in 2008, the auditing teams were moved into the network directorate. So I think there was a two-year span where I reported to Keith Woolard, and by 2008, the auditing arm of my team moved organisationally. Thank you. Um, and you became compliance risk and assurance manager. Yep. You've said that that involved providing management information on compliance audit activity. Very briefly, can you tell us what that involved? Yeah, I mean, essentially, at that time in Keith Woolard's team, there's a greater focus on compliance risk um, with regulatory obligations, so anti-money laundering, um, providing assurance to Bank of Ireland and other partners, NSNI, DVLA. So my role was to use the audit findings, albeit the auditors were no longer reporting to me, but to use their findings on compliance activity to provide assurance to our clients and partners. And you were on something called the Post Office Risk and Compliance Committee. Yes. On it, I attended many of the meetings, probably not all of them. I think you took minutes at those meetings, did you? Again, probably minutes is perhaps I took notes, and that was not at every meeting. So I think the responsibility for those minutes or notes was shared with someone from security. Thank you. Um, we'll look at some minutes in due course, but can you give us some examples of the types of person that sat on that committee, how high up in the company they were, for example? Well, it was a subcommittee of the executive team, so it would include directors from the team. It would also be chaired, over time it changed, but I think Sir Mike Hodgkinson was chairing it at some point, Alan Cook was chairing it at some point, um, and then at each of those meetings, people would be invited, depending on the subject of the day, to present something or talk about something or be questioned about something. And that committee had a link to the, the board of poll? To the executive team, which in turn had a link to the board, yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to take you to your witness statement, paragraph 90 to 92. That's WITN 08. 610100. Thank you very much. And it's paragraph 90 to 92. Um, that is page 27. Thank you. I'll just read that out. That says at 90, with the exception of issues encountered during a communication failure slash power outage at a branch for which there were fallback processes, I did not have, nor was I aware of any concerns regarding the robustness of the Horizon system during my time working for the post office. Any issues I had um, heard about seemed to be considered as related to in-branch slash user error. Um, as I didn't have any concerns, there was no communication uh, decision to make. I was not aware of any instruction given to auditors to disregard possible problems with Horizon as a possible cause for discrepancies, noting that I did not have direct contact with branch auditors after those roles moved organizationally into the network directorate. Um, so in none of the roles that we have already discussed, so from heading the network audit to um, your involvement in the Post Office Risk and Compliance Committee, um, 
in the latter half of the first decade of the, the uh, 2000s. Um, did you hear anyone raise issues with the robustness of Horizon? I guess it depends on the, de you know, the definition of robustness. I think there were glitches and there were the occasional things that came to light such as um, screens freezing or amounts being stuck in suspense. Um, these, from my position at the time, seemed to affect individual branches um, rather than being systemic across the whole of the network, which what I would have expected from a system that wasn't robust. So uh, if we look at paragraph 90, for example, you, mm -hmm. you talk there about a communication failure and a power outage at a yep. branch. Um, what you might understand is a, a hardware failure or something along those lines. Yes. Um, what you don't mention there is bugs, errors, or, or other defects. Okay. I mean, in terms of bugs, I suppose from my perspective, um, perspective at the time, and even now, would be that any software will have some bugs. That's why we have software updates and fixes. So I think there's always a sense of there might be some issues in the system, but they're being fixed with the software updates, but nothing from my perspective that made me feel that the system wasn't robust. And I don't remember people talking in those terms either. They may not have been talking it in terms of robustness, but okay. are we to take it from what's written there and from your oral evidence that you were aware uh, in general terms that there were bugs, errors and defects, but that your view was that they were corrected by updates? They were corrected in, in some form or other, so updates or uh, a manual workaround. So there were issues, individual issues, that had been reported, um, but as I said, nothing to me that made me feel like this was a systemic problem across the whole estate. And where were you receiving that information from? So the fact that these issues were corrected, for example? I guess in terms of audit activity, so you know, at an audit activity it might be a case of this is an issue that's being resolved or this is an issue that's currently um, happening to me because I've got an amount in suspense that doesn't, uh, shouldn't be there. Um, so probably from audit activity would be the main source. When you say audit activity, do you mean branch auditors on the ground branch reporting back to you? Yeah, through, through their audit reports. And the fact that those issues had been corrected, was that coming also from the auditors or was, or was there someone else in the company who was reassuring you that those kinds of bugs I mean, that's being... a good question. I'm not entirely sure there's always that sense of it was being corrected. It was a known problem and someone was looking at it was perhaps the um, assurance, for want of a better word, that I was given. Uh, and the someone, who, who would that be? Would that be post office, Fujitsu, helpline? A combination of both. A combination of um, the two helplines, so initially Horizon Support or MBSC. I want to ask you, before we get on to specific examples, um, just some very basic questions, because you're going to be the first of our policy witnesses, and, and okay. we'll, we'll hear from people who are on the ground. But I, I'll, I'll start by asking you about the basics of auditing. Um, when one thinks of auditors, you think of, for example, an accountant who signs off uh, company accounts. Um, can you tell us uh, about the job of a post office branch auditor? Because you've distinguished between the network or the, the branch auditors and, and, for example, the national auditors. Yeah, so using your example, I'd say the auditors um, were more like stock takers, that they would go to a branch to physically count, broadly speaking, cash and stock and some other items, and validate that they were there in comparison to what should be there. Were they accountants or people with particular qualifications? No, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, this resource was, broadly speaking, um, a set of staff that came from a counter experience, Crown Office background, without any auditing qualifications. I'm not aware of any single member of the team that would have had an auditing qualification. Can you tell us the difference during your period of involvement between an auditor and an investigator? Okay, so there were two separate roles and two separate teams. Um, as I mentioned in the organisational structure, there was a point when the audit and investigation teams reported 
to Tony Marsh, Head of Security and Audit. Um, but prior and after that, you know, we separated into different areas as well. But to answer the question, the auditor's role was to go out there and to verify that assets were at the branch and where they weren't, um, over a certain amount of discrepancy, there would be a kind of a line drawn and then the investigation um, team would be involved. So they would um, come to the branch and start to investigate the matter further. In addition to the network management team. So there was like two reporting lines at that point. One would go to network management to make decisions, contractual, and the investigators would be involved in making more um, in-depth investigations into potentially what the cause of the discrepancy was. We, we've heard at some points, particularly in the human impact evidence that we heard in phase one of this inquiry, um, evidence about auditors and investigators attending a, a branch together. Did you have experience of that? Absolutely. So ordinarily what would happen for a routine audit, and what I mean by routine is we're going there um, without expecting to find any um, problem, issue, discrepancy, and when we do, we report it up to network and investigations, and in those cases, people from network and or investigations would then come to the branch. But also there will be types of audits which will be requested by the investigation team. So the investigation team may be doing some work, understanding there's potential risk at this branch. They would arrange what would be called a special audit, and they would ask us to turn up at this branch on a certain day, and they would be there. Often they will be waiting outside until we finish the audit accounts. And once we finish the audit accounts, they will then make the decision as to whether to pursue the matter further. I don't remember, but I may be wrong, that auditors and investigators would turn up at the same time. There may have been occasion when that happened, but generally speaking, the auditors would arrive, perform their task, and then if required, the investigation team would come in. Looking back, can you see any problem with the auditors and the investigators being in the branch at the same time from the perspective of the sub-postmaster? It might feel quite intimidating. Um, and it might feel like almost being, that they've been set up. Um, but I think from, from our perspective, from my perspective, as long as there's clear, defined responsibilities that we pursued our role up to this point, and then at that point, the investigation team decided what to do, um, then that responsibility line for me was quite clear. But I can understand from a human impact point of view, it may feel quite intimidating to, to be faced with two activities at the same time. Was there any separate guidance for when an auditor was present and at the same time as an investigator, when there was an investigation going on as to how the auditor should conduct themselves? How should they conduct themselves? Well, did they have any training on investigation methods or uh, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act or continuity of evidence or anything like no. that? No, I mean, they, they performed their role as they were required to do. And then at that point, as I said, if there was a requirement to pursue the matter further, the investigation team would pursue it. I think the only overlap would be the investigation team might ask the auditors to obtain extra reports, but that would be it. Uh, and we'll, we'll go on to talk about the kinds of reports that auditors mm -hmm. could obtain. Um, could we first look at poll 00086769, please? A document will be brought onto screen. It's a 2011 document, October 2011. So you, you probably weren't involved at the time. Um, this is a business loss program board report. But it, it's page nine that I'd like to look at. And it's just a description of the role of audit. Um, thank you very much. So it says there, although often spoken of as if it were a fraud prevention device, audit is in reality simply a means of checking whether the assets within a branch correspond to our record of assets. Uh, where there is a discrepancy, it is not necessarily possible to say how the difference arose. Is that something that you would agree with, that description? 
Let me just read it again. I would agree with it. Um, maybe the first sentence often spoken as a fraud I mean, I'm not sure often, but certainly sometimes spoken as a fraud detection device. Well, reading that, what was the essence of an auditor's job, essentially, to check whether X equaled Y in the branch? Yeah, so, you know, both before and after Horizon, we would, my team would go in and essentially verify that the physical assets matched up to what should be there. So that would be creating a cash account of sorts, um, and that would be essentially their job, stock-taking um, activity. And that looking into uh, why the difference arose w was not really part of the auditor's function? Not, a, not really. I think it would be a case of if there was a discrepancy, there would be an effort to identify why that might be. So, for example, I've audited branches in the past. My first reaction would be, have I done something wrong? Have I got the wrong figures, I missed something off. So I think initially their role would be to make sure they've got everything, and they included everything. They would probably, well not probably, they would talk to the person in charge uh, and say, look, this is our current position. Can you shed any light on it? So not interviewing as such, but just sort of establishing, have we got everything we need to have? And often that would then translate to, yes, I know about this, um, or a case of, I have no idea. Um, at that point, the, invest, um, sorry, the auditors would then, again, just go through some of the um, information that's available on site, but at that point, if there is a significant discrepancy, it would then be flagged up on this escalation process. Thank you, I can come down. Um, in your experience, was the line between those who, who were auditors and those who could, for example, close a branch or pursue criminal action um, in comparison to those who could just carry out that kind of pure mathematical calculation, uh, was that clearly delineated? So in, just to be clear what you mean about closing a branch. Do you mean the decision to close the branch or the act of closing the branch? Either or both. Okay. So the decision to, take, um, to close a branch was never a responsibility of the audit team. So any decision to close a branch would be at the network possibly with investigation input, but the network management would decide whether, on the basis of our findings, it was necessary to close a branch. If the decision was to close a branch, then my audit team would effectively um, produce the final cash account, remit the items that were in, in hand. So, yes, there would be some involvement in the closing of the branch, but kind of a technical movement of cash and stock, or transferring it to somebody else. So sometimes, wasn't so much the branch was closed, but maybe the sub postmaster was precautionally suspended, and an interim sub postmaster was found. So rather than having to close the branch, an option could be just to transfer the assets to this interim sub postmaster. And who would make that decision? The decision would always be made by the network. And do you think it was clear to sub-postmasters, managers, etc., cetera, um, of that delineation? I think with hindsight, probably not. And I think um, I know there are occasions when I've heard of, um, and particularly sub-postmasters, but also Crown Office staff as well, had um, complained about the conduct or behaviour of an auditor. And when I found out the person's name, I've realised, well, it wasn't an auditor, it was an inv investigator. So clearly there wasn't um, a, a, a communication to the sub to say, this is my role. I believe that auditors would go into a branch and make it clear, we're here to audit the branch. I don't know what process took place when the investigators came in and whether those lines were blurry. So from a sub point of view, they've got four people in the branch. They're all part of the same team, perhaps from their perspective. Thank you very much. I'm going to take you to a um, illustration of the divisions of the roles, and I, I wonder if you can assist us. It's poll 0008497 Oh goodness. Um, you may have seen this in your bundle. Um, 
And if we could, thank you very much. If we could just look at one to four, so uh, exactly where you are currently on the screen. Um, okay. Using this illustration, is it right to say that if there was a discrepancy, um, then it's notified to the contract advisor, investigation team, and network compliance manager? Um, I mean, that's essentially what you've already told us this morning, that yeah. the job I mean, of the auditor... This is a, um, a flowchart for uh, the team after 2008, but I think, broadly speaking, that would be the flow prior to this as well. And is that irrespective of how the discrepancy arose? I guess it um, depends on the network's decision-making process. So they will be told this is a discrepancy, it's X amount, there may or may not be a reason at that point, so it may well be there's already been an admission or um, this figure in the balance snapshot or the office snapshot doesn't equate to this other figure. So they will be given some fact-finding um, outputs, I suppose, to make their decision. But sometimes, as you kind of alluded to, it wouldn't be clear. It wouldn't be clear whether it was um, a, a loss due to a, a known error or um, something in the account which didn't look right, it just wouldn't be clear. So res irrespective, that figure would be related to the network team to make a decision. Thank you. And if we turn over the page, it will identify there uh, what then happens. Can you, if you're able to, briefly walk us through the process that's outlined there from the audit team's perspective? So and, and if it doesn't reflect what happened when you were there, then please tell us any differences. Yeah, I, th I think the one thing that, that strikes me is probably not as I would remember it, is on the left-hand side, there's a diamond shape towards the middle. It says, are there financial regulators or suspicious circumstances? And then there's a, a, a dot down to a box of buttons so saying, seek proposals to make good discrepancy. In my mind, we wouldn't do that. Um, in my mind, if there was any known issue, um, and, and certainly admission of, of, of theft, for example, um, or any other suspicious activity, we wouldn't seek proposals to make it good. That, again, would be left with the network management team to decide how they want to proceed. So that looks slightly out of kilter with what I would remember of the process when I was there. But essentially, it leads down to the contract advisors. Yes. Um, you've used the word known issues a, c a couple of times. OK. Um, what this box, this, this explainer doesn't seem to show, is what to do um, if a discrepancy is unexplained. Um, was there a focus on, on that particular type of issue? Um, was there enough training, for example, or explanation to the audit team as to what to do in those circumstances? No, I think, and I think with hindsight, there probably should be more guidance than training, but essentially what would happen is if there's a discrepancy and it can't be identified for any, other re for any reason, then it would be reported for someone to make a decision. Probably what should have been happening was to look in more detail, and certainly if an investigation team wasn't involved, because they would normally start to delve more into detail. So there should have been probably more guidance to the auditors to say, this is what perhaps you could look for. And I don't think there was, and there should have been. And this really matches um, the explanation that you previously gave, that an auditor was there to see if X matched Y, not to look I, into I saw them y. as fact finders. They, they gathered the facts as they saw them and provided that information to make a decision. Thank you. I, I'd like to now look at how often audits took place. Mm -hmm. um, that can come down. Thank you. You've explained in your statement that prior to 1993, audits were scheduled on a cyclical basis. Can you briefly explain? I, I appreciate that's a, a long time ago now. But did I say 1993? I, I believe you, you did. Um, but if it's not, then please say. Um, in my head, it's 1999. But um, well, I think it moved to something called a frequency basis on 1999. 
it, it's a little unclear in the witness statement. Okay. That's why. So let me try and clarify it then. So when I joined um, the audit team in 1999-1990, um, branches were essentially audited on a frequency basis. It was either every 12 months, 27 months, 39 months. So basically one, two, three years. Uh, with some exceptions. The exceptions being if they were known as being high risk. And the high risk was quite crude at that point. It was the previous audit finding um, a high risk issue to consider? Or were there lots of error notices? So apart from those two factors, broadly speaking, branches were audited on this cyclical basis, one, two, three years. Is that every branch? Every branch. Crown Office, every branch. So at that point, there would have been about 20,000 branches. So every branch filtered into these three categories of, of, of um, frequency. Um, you're right about the 1993 to some degree. Um, so in 1993, the national audit team, the post office internal audit team, developed a risk model um, which was put out to the seven regional audit teams to use. So the national audit team developed the model, but it was deployed, operated by the regional audit teams. And that had essentially a number of uh, metrics that identified the risk of branches. That was used from around about 1993 to 1999. As part of the review of regional audit teams in 1999, it became clear that that risk model was felt flawed in as much as the high risk models, um, the high risk branches in that model tended just to be the biggest branches. So all the crowns and all the big branches were always filtering to the top. And it was therefore difficult to maintain this frequency because all the high risk branches were tending to be bigger branches. So as part of that project in 1999, the frequency approach was removed in place of just purely risk model selection. Thank you very much. We're going to look at something called the audit process manual. Mm -hmm. I think you've described in your witness statement there was a policy manual and a process manual. Is that correct? Yep. Uh, and what was the purpose of the audit process manual? The audit process manual was really a guide to auditors in how to perform their work. So going back to the point of we've got seven regional audit teams, which also was the basis of having 32 district teams prior to that, all operating in different ways, different practices. So in designing this new network audit team in 1999-ish, the audit process manual was designed to bring some consistency so that people auditing in Scotland would be doing the same thing as people auditing in Cornwall. So that essentially was the, the purpose. Also, going back to pre-1995, we didn't have computers, we didn't have Word documents. So a lot of the process was just local knowledge. You knew it or you didn't know it, and it wasn't really documented in how to do an audit. So as we became more automated or using commuters more, there was a, a desire to put things on paper to both provide that consistency of approach, but also have it documented for new people, not that we got many, but to enable them to understand, well, how do I do my work? It's all laid out. Um, so its purpose was for the network field team rather than for, for example, individual branches? Yes. Can we look at poll 00084650, please? Thank you very much. This is chapter one mm -hmm. of the audit process manual, um, audit plan and scheduling. And is this the chapter that sets out how audits were scheduled? Uh, I appreciate that this is dated yeah. a, a bit later on, but it, in essence, I think... Yeah, it it's there. three years after I um, left that sort of area. But equally, um, the layout, the setup, the content is broadly the same. Thank you. And the various versions are at the bottom of this page. So we have an original version, 2002. Can we turn to page three, please? And it's 
paragraph 2.1 on page 3. So 2.1 and 2.2 refer to something called the financial branch performance profile. Can you talk us through that? And is that what you were talking about when you said the system changed? Or was it something different? Well, it's 2011. It's not a term I would know. But I suspect it's similar to the risk model that I would have known. And that risk model changed its name over time. It, at one point, it was called the Financial Audit Risk Model Acronym Farm. Um, there was another acronym of ALARM, which I can't remember now what that would stand for. But basically, those um, were risk models, I suspect. And looking at 2.2, the, the sort of metrics within it, it looks to be the same. It's just a different name. Um, so you've explained that early on, there were regular scheduled audits of all post offices. But then it went mm. to a uh, risk-based model that was multifactorial. Yeah. Um, and what was the purpose behind that? Was it um, to reduce the number of audits, ultimately? That I think it's because reduce, uh, there were audits um, being reduced. So because of uh, headcount reduction, cost reduction, the, the level of staff was reducing all the time, there was a need to make sure the resource that we've got available um, is utilised as much as we can. So the idea was to... Um, to target our resource to where we felt there was the biggest risk. Um, in addition to that model, whatever the model may have been called at the relevant time, mm -hmm. there were other bases for carrying out an audit. So I think one yep. was robbery and burglary, yep. a planned audit. I think if we look at 3.7, so that's over the page, um, in fact, page 5, there's something called random audits. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Yes. So, because I'd kind of admitted that in the previous um, explanation that, yes, we have a risk model approach that um, replaces the purely cyclical approach, but there was always a considered risk of if we only ever audit the branches with the highest risk, there'll be some branches who may never see us. Um, even though on the profile it looks like th th the risk is quite low. So the idea was twofold with the random audits, was to A, make sure that there's always a chance that any branch could be audited, because from a pure random sample, you, you know, it could be uh, um, audited tomorrow. Um, but also, it gave us a baseline measure. It enabled us to say, right, if we just purely um, audits, base, um, audits on a random basis, this is what we're likely to find, and can compare that to the risk indicators. And in terms of numbers, what, what kind of numbers are we looking at for random audits versus or percentages versus planned? It was, it was 5%. So whatever the numbers were, it, I think it was always designed as being 5% of the total plan being random selected. Just to pick up on the robbery and burglary, those sort of activities and transfers as well, they were kind of event-driven. Um, so, you know, a burglary happens, we have to go and attend today. A transfer scheduled for next Tuesday. We're planning to go next Tuesday. So they were always announced visits. The the person at the branch would know what were coming. Whereas the random audits, the risk profile audits, would be unannounced activities. Thank you very much. Um, that can come down. Thank you. Can we now now talk about um, information that's available to the auditors themselves in the mm -hmm. branch? Can we look at poll 00084801, please? Um, so this is sticking with the audit process manual, uh, but this is chapter three. Do you, do you recall in your time how many chapters there were of the process manual? I'm sure there's an index somewhere in the documents that I've seen, but quite a few. Um, so we're here, chapter three, performing a branch audit. Is that also um, aimed at the network field team itself? Yeah, I think the whole process manual, the individual chapters are all designed internally with members of the team. And this one is, um, it's a 2010 version, uh, version 5.1. Uh, but am I right in saying that from the 1999 onwards, there was some form of... Yeah, so in 1999, or thereabouts, this process manual was designed. It was, it was, you know, it evolved over time, um, but yet yeah, there was always a manual of this format from 1999.
from 1999 onwards. Thank you. Could we look at page three, please? Um, at 2.1, it sets out three different types of audit. A financial assurance, um, both FAA and tier two, a compliance audit and a follow-up audit. Um, are those the delineations that you recognize or was it something different? Yes, yes. And can you briefly take us through the difference between the okay. three or in fact four different types of audit? So in terms of the top bullet point, financial assurance and tier two, um, I, and I don't know the timeline of when this changed, but there came a point, again, with headcount reduction, um, with less and less resource, but still the same level of branches to go out to, a decision was taken um, to perform what's called a tier one audit, a financial assurance audit. So the first part of the audit would be um, to verify the high value items. So all the cash, um, high level items of stock against what should be at the branch. And if that didn't reveal any concerns or discrepancy, that would be the end of the financial audit. If there were any concerns, it would then be extended to tier two Tier two was basically a previous audit, a full financial audit. So the financial assurance audit was just simply just check the key high-risk value items of, uh, at the branch. If they are, move on. If they're not, do a full audit. So have I understood correctly that at the same time the frequency of audits was reducing because of the reduction in headcount, for example... Um, there was also a change in the depth of the uh, basic audit. Yes, yeah, certainly, I, I say I don't know the timeline, but when this financial assurance, I'd say mid-2000s, but I'm guessing, but certainly there was, there was a point where there was this challenge of reducing headcount, how do we perform the same number of activities? So the, the only way to do it, perhaps, would be to reduce the activity over more branches rather than having a full audit at less branches. Do you want me to go on to the next two? Bullet yes, thank you very much. So the compliance auditing, um, if I take you back to 1990, a long way, but <coughs> at that point the audit was basically just a financial audit and a view on security. So it, is the partial hat secure, are alarms tested, things like that. Um, Going to 2000 and beyond, as we took on more products and more clients and became more involved in regulatory affairs, we had a role to perform compliance audit activity. So when an auditor went in, by and large, they do both audits on the same um, event. So they do the financial audit. Once that had been completed, they would then move into the compliance auditing activity. So there's a range of compliance audit tests to be completed across a range of different aspects. So it could be anti-money laundering requirements, it could be DVLA's requirements, there's a range of product-based requirements. Um, so they'll be doing some testing to, to respond to these compliance activities. And that would be part of the same report, but it would be it would go off in different channels in terms of how it would be used. In your view, was there sufficient resource and time to now dedicate an auditor's time to compliance issues as well as the financial assurance issues? I think with hindsight, it was quite demanding for an auditor to go into a branch and look at all of those aspects. Sometimes they had to um, defer the compliance audit activity because the financial activity had taken so long. Or sometimes, for example, if a sub-postmaster wasn't at the branch, then there wouldn't much merit in performing the compliance activity, and we'd probably arrange to come back at a convenient time for both of us. Um, but yeah, there was quite a lot of activity to perform. Um, but the financial audit always took place first, so that was the priority before the compliance activity kicked in. And just before we finish for lunch, can you tell us about the follow-up audit and what that was? Um, probably less clear about the follow-up audit, but uh, I guess what would happen is that if there we, would be... We can turn to two points. If we scroll down, it may assist. Oh, okay. To 2.6. Okay. It's, it's answered 
Santa there for you then, basically. That's the, when we went to a branch, and particularly with compliance activity, if there were issues that need to be addressed, the follow-up activity was to go back at a later point to ensure that those points had been addressed. Thank you very much. I have a few more questions on this document relating to um, the information that was available to an auditor, but I think, mm -hmm. given where we are on the time, we'll, we'll break now for lunch until 2 o'clock and we can come back to the same document. Okay. All right, that's good. So I'll see you all at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank and um, I, I, talk about anything except your evidence, all right? Fine. Thank you.